G'day guys, and welcome back to my channel. Sorry it's been a minute, it's good to be back, having some free time to make a video, so let's get into today's episode. And today was sort of a bit of a mishmash. It's maybe a continuation, sort of, of my uh, English castle narrative, and we're just going to continue on down that path, uh, investigating, you know, the era of the Edwardian era, uh, the Victorian era, and some discrepancies, you know, with the architects and just the narrative in itself. And we're going to try and get through a few things today. Um, so bear with me, sit back, relax, take your shoes off. And uh, why don't we start with one of my favorite topics, which is Freemasonry. And you're probably thinking, why? We're looking at Edwardian architecture, right? So Edwardian after the Victorian era, so 1901 to 1910 was his reign. And a lot of developments in architecture during this period. And I've always found European, uh, well, the, the narrative of the UK interesting, basically because it spans all over the world. You know, they colonized America, Australia, and for a period, the ruler of England was the emperor of India, and really still to this day has a massive control. And, you know, I'd say that most government houses are puppets to the British crown, in my opinion. So why are we looking at a Freemason? Now, England basically uh, has quite a few architects that really made an impact. One of them is Sir Christopher Wren. And if you've never heard this name before, um, it w wouldn't surprise me. I mean, a cross-dressing uh, judge by the look of it in modern day terms but this guy here we'll, we'll read a little bit about him was the most highly acclaimed English architect in history so I know in Australia we didn't learn about this guy perhaps in the US would be exactly the same and I challenge my friends in the UK to get back to me and tell me if they've ever heard of this dude because you know he was an anatomist an astronomer a geometer, I don't even know what a geometer is, a mathematician physicist. He was accorded responsibility for 52 churches in the city of London after the Great Fire. Okay, at first glance that might seem all well and good, but luckily we all have our discernment filter firmly attached and to me I smell bullshit. 52 buildings, 52 classical buildings, so why don't we take a closer look at this guy. So a very, very interesting story, and I'm just going to say straight off the bat, I think this is a fictitious character of history, and big statement, but you know, the same old poses of many Freemasons of the period. He's got the compass right here, so symbology of Freemasonry, if you weren't aware of that. And something that I, I find interesting is just as I'll try and zoom in here a little bit. This was painted in 1733, and if you know anything about uh, Freemasonry and numerology, the numbers, geometria, etc., you'll realize that the number 33 often pops up. And it, it's sort of just my sign to say, yeah, look, you're on the right track. Now, Christopher Wren's university where he studied for two years only, so 52 classical buildings only takes two years to study um, at the ripe old age of, you know, 18, I think it was. The crenellated style sandstone building, extremely intricate when it comes to foundations etc because buildings like this the, the weight of these type of buildings would be incredible so the engineering uh, knowledge 
seems to be a bit of a mystery. A bust in probably his uh, museum stand. Some more masonry symbology, I'd say. I'm not sure. I guess I've seen something similar. It's always to do with the hands. And, you know, man or woman. Keep confused. I mean, it's... I don't understand the long hair thing. So this is St. Paul's Cathedral, an interior shot. Obviously what he's most well known for. We're going to go through his buildings in just a moment. But doesn't this look just a little bit occult? Now, I haven't found much masonry symbology or artwork. I haven't been looking that hard, to be honest. I've just seen enough from the fact that you know, the guy built 52 churches after 1666, and his thing was painted in 1733. Within the first five minutes, I've got signs of occult gematria and all these different numbers which are pointing to, you know, you could say you're reading into it, but that's what we do here in a red pill society. So here's the finished product. You know, here's a, they're trying to say that this was also a drawing competition where he sampled a few different designs before finally reaching this gorgeous, glorious building here. Hampton Court. Now, I used to live in a place called Hampton Court in the middle of nowhere, Australia. So I found it really strange that I don't think that the building I lived in was named after this. I think it's more of a coincidence, but... I know there's someone out there right now losing their shit over the fact that we both lived in a place called Hampton Court and here it is popping up in Tartarian Research. Another building that Chris designed and built, the Trinity College. You can see this seems to be maybe a slight slant, could be an old mud flutter. Regardless, it's one huge solid structure, isn't it? And... This guy didn't become an architect until later in his life, which is what made me stop. Now, I've looked at this guy maybe months ago, um, and I, I couldn't really put together much to say about him, other than the fact that I, I despise Freemasons. <laughs> and I think that, that interests me to look into them further. I want to know everything about these horrible parasites. And, I mean, look what they claim to have built for us when it's just not, it's just not true because the technology, the, the resources at the time of, of these buildings being built, it just doesn't add up. The skills, you know, these people aren't from Europe. They have no connection to Rome. Yet their buildings are of the same mould. So, more St. Paul's Cathedral. The Lantern. Now, perhaps some sort of decommissioned ancient tech. Perhaps filled with red mercury. We don't know. But you can definitely see the neoclassical, you know, Greco-Roman style. <laughs> it's just, it's mind-blowing. Look at this intricacy of this building. So, to do... And look, the, the Masonic floor. Now, to build one of these in a lifetime is an accomplishment. Uh, the first Renaissance builder only built a dome in his lifetime. Christopher Wren built 52 buildings with domes. And all of them have intricacies like this on the interior of the dome. I think that's the red flag right there that this guy has just been named as a architect when really they don't know his name has just been slapped onto these buildings in a period where no one's going to question it because no one can prove it doubling up more masonic floors so i think it's pretty clear to say that yes there is masonic symbology in his architecture and i'm sure the busts and statues are his inspiration. I wouldn't be surprised if there's Satan somewhere. 
although I don't know how Freemasonry was back then, but I'm sure they're just as greedy as modern day versions. Now this looks like a building that has been extended with red brick, perhaps two different generations. This old stonework here, facades with all this sort of art on the front here. So it's a lot of work for one man, traveling the entire world, uh, drawing up <laughs> these really inspiring buildings. Um, and what, handing the work to master stonemasons for them to complete all over the country within 30 years, perhaps. More Masonic floor. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just sort of take a gander down at Freemason research, just take a look at a bit of their symbology and you'll prove to yourself that they do exist, whether or not we've taken some information and run with it, because that's what the truth community does, it's a very noisy community at times. Isn't the sym symmetrical work just astounding, considering this is all done in the 15th and 16th century, still standing today, just glorious work really really solid stuff so just keep in mind this is all one man now this actually looks like a lodge a freemason lodge all it's missing is a marble altar but the colors and the floor and the wooden seats all ring freemason lodge to me more red brick architecture and you'll notice that this guy's uh, style is very similar across the buildings. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a few of you guys live around these areas. You know, I'm not reading them all, but it's all listed down here. It'd be so cool to visit London and just take a look through because you know, the UK definitely holds a secret to our history, uh, considering they own and have written most of it uh, for us in, you know, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, India, and America. Um, so I, I always tend to come back trying to find the origins of this, this new world society that we currently live in. And when did the old world stop? And when did the new world take over? <laughs> Some chemtrails in the background. Some pineal gland style art in the altar. And, you know, we're taking for granted that the cornices detail, you know, that's months of work. This is, this is just one pylon of you know, 30 in a building that are 50 foot high and uh, <laughs> a ceiling, unsupported ceiling, you know, where there's no poles in the middle. So do you know the structure here is just absolutely groundbreaking for the period that they're building it? Because even today they're building structures with buttresses hanging out either side to support buildings like this. We just don't know how these guys had the knowledge to build this type of engineering and is it filled with cast iron for strength is it one solid structure another court style and you know we're still on the same guy he's just done so much well they've claimed that he's accomplished all these buildings in one lifetime and architecture was not his first profession in fact it was his fourth profession so it wasn't even his passion and here's his house that he lived in of course <laughs> of course he lived in this tiny little house like any architect that builds grandiose structures like this definitely deserve a house like this. 
in a nice quiet street. My goodness. So, perhaps we can just go back to his page. So after flicking through uh, the info on this guy's page, I searched his name and just tried to find a little bit more information on his Freemasonry side. And Freemasonry Network definitely were aware of his prior <laughs> involvement in the Freemasonry cult. So there's a video here. Why don't we... Let's not and say we did. That was really boring. Now... Carrying on with the Edwardian era and trying to find some discrepancies in the narrative, I can always assume that architecture will find something so we'll read a little bit about Edwardian architecture. The notable architects included Edwin Lutyens, Charles Rennie Mackintosh, and Giles Gilbert Scott. In spite of the popularity of Art Nouveau in Europe, the Edwardian Baroque style of architecture was widely favoured for public structures and was a revival of Christopher Wren-inspired designs of the late 17th and 18th centuries. So, a lot of, I mean, a lot of rubbish, in my opinion. It's just a lot of gibberish. I'm not really interested in any of that. Uh, I'm interested in things like this. So the White City Stadium for the 1908 Summer Olympics was the first Olympic stadium in the UK. Brilliant, right? Did you know that this was built on a World's Fair site? Like so many American World's Fair sites that are currently today a public park or a memorial or something like this. This Franco-British exhibition in the UK became a stadium and also held the first Summer Olympics. So I'm not sure how <clears throat> all that ties in but you can definitely see how using these old sites and rebranding them um, for modern events and that will cause people to forget past events like the British exhibition because when people go to this stadium they're going to talk about the Summer Olympics not the Franco-British exhibition so seeming as they're not going to tell us more about it why don't we take a look ourselves so the Franco-British exhibition and by the looks of it, it was a huge event. Eight million visitors, and it celebrated a 10-day cordial, which is a series of agreements signed on the 8th of April between 1904 between the United Kingdom and the French Republic, which saw a significant improvement in Anglo-French relations. And that's interesting because French and the United Kingdom are always at each other, yet so close to each other, and in modern times work very, very well together. But in the early periods, the narrative will tell you that the French teamed up with the Indians, the American Indians, to battle against the colonial British Americans. The French also teamed up with Indians in India when the British invasion of India was going on and France uh, helped the Mughals even though they lost. So what I'm trying to say is it seems that France continually was helping many other different uh, civilizations against Britain. Why? Why was France so against Britain's spread? And I, I don't think it's just because, you know, pride and respect, etc. 
I truly believe that these two countries knew of the worldwide civilization that had already spread architecture, engineering, and genius really across the globe, and, and they were trying to inherit and revive all of these ideals into this modern world, this modern realm that we currently live in. Again, speculation, but I would really like to know why France, over time, is always helping the other team. <laughs> So let's take a closer look at the Franco-British exhibition. The fair was the largest exhibition of its kind in Britain. We've heard that before. It's the first international exhibition co-organized and sponsored by two countries. Can you guess who they were? So it covered an area of 140 acres. That is insanity. That's the, one of the biggest uh, sites I've ever seen. So keeping in mind that these sites would have had, you know, over a hundred um, classical style buildings. And we'll, turn, we'll just try and take a look at a few photos. Hopefully we can find some of these buildings. I mean, a really strange style photo, obviously edited, and perhaps because in the background was all sorts of city skyline that is currently erased. Now, I don't think we're going to find two... yeah, look at that. So, there's not much on this fair, considering around this time the the amount of inventions that were being unveiled to the public. Uh, they would have happened at events like this, but we're not hearing about it. Or reading about it. Instead we're reading about things like this. On the 14th of August 1908, a balloon owned by American balloonist Captain Loveless exploded at the exhibition. Killing his eight I mean, like, explain to us that this imbecile dropped a match. Now, the newspaper reports indicated that the explosion occurred when a lighted match, is that even English? When a lighted match was thrown to the ground during preparations for a flight. So why has these idiots got matches around a balloon? Like it just to me it doesn't feel like we design these balloons and stuff. I bet you they're at the sites and So after being used for more exhibitions up to 1914, the site fell into disrepair and was unused for over 20 years. So let's spend hundreds of millions of dollars on 151 acres of buildings, a built out area, and then let it fall into disrepair and unused. So it was then demolished bit by bit. Bit by bit seems interesting, so there, it does seem to be a long process, maybe an expensive process, and that doesn't make sense because all the buildings were supposed to be wood and plaster, so you'd think the cleanup would be quite quick. And nevertheless, how the hell do these plaster, wooden plaster buildings last for years and years and years out in the open, out in the rain and weather? Things that I don't think we think about, we just accept that. Oh yeah, World's Fair, 1908, lasted 15 years. Next. So, that's just our, our modern way of thinking. On to the next, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. And I like to stop and smell the roses sometimes and call them out for the... Speaking of bullshit. So, Edward Lutons. Obviously an English name, not. Um... March 1869 to January 1944 was an English architect known for imaginatively adapting traditional architectural style and now we've heard that exact sentence um, Cass Gilbert who like to adapt traditional styles with ancient era it's just it's bullshit these guys did not imaginatively adapt traditional architecture to eras of the past these people are fictitious. <laughs> These stories are fictitious. Now, 
we'll carry on. So, an English architecture, he designed many English country houses, war memorials, and public buildings. Let's take a look at what this gentleman did. Okay, so reading through, it seems that this guy's got more discrepancies than I thought. So we'll read a little bit about his early life, just to get to paint the picture. Lutyens was born in Kensington, London, the 10th of 13 children, Ra ra ra. from Kalani Island. Get into his works here, and I think it'd be easier if we take a look at where he actually uh, built these structures. Okay, so in 1912 to 1930, for 20 years or so, he was building this. This is in India. It's called Viceroy House, and it's currently where the president lives today. And that's where he lived. In red brick. And perhaps one of his first designs, or where he lived in Surrey, I'd say. And, you know, coming from bare bones like this to then building the Viceroy House in India. I mean, what do you reckon? So Tavistock Street, red brick with the facade. I'm not sure what these are. These look like something that he would have designed, getting into his buildings now. Now, has anyone heard of this guy before? Lutyens? On a mound? It's under there. <laughs> From a red brick gothic style house to this Greek neoclassical, like, Roman... There's some, some interesting things to be found about the railway, I reckon. More arcs. Delhi, 1921. So he built this simultaneously as the Viceroy's. And what, did he build this? Now, this is where things get interesting to me. Now all these buildings are glorious, like they're, they're nothing to shake a stick at. They're all extremely spectacular. I think I'm desensitized a little bit uh, just because I look at so many photos of old architecture that it doesn't really surprise me. Of course I'm, in, you know, intrigued by it. But I'm more interested now in finding out about the lies. I think that's more interesting. So we're just travelling through <laughs> Castle Drogo. We're just travelling through this gentleman's work and look at this Masonic building. <laughs> Hampton Court Bridge. So the court has a bridge and it's obviously a man-made lake. Very shallow and possibly a moat. Some sort of defence. A model of the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. Looks like something out of Jerusalem. Or, or Russia. <laughs> Metropolitan Cathedral. These arcs are really strange. This is a red brick one. Memorial House. So again, all one man. Very interesting. Now, Let's take a look here. Largely designed by Lutyens in New Delhi, this is. Over 20 years, 1912 to 1930. Okay, so he's the architect, I get that. He's not the mason that's actually getting his hands dirty and building these. But wasn't he in England? I swear. So, major buildings and projects. Let's have a look. So Munstead Wood, okay, so he, these are his buildings. 
This is 1897. The Orchids, okay, so pretty basic. 1899, a couple of years later, Goddards, again, same, basic, gothic style. Tickborn, a little bit more intricate in 1901. Tenhari Garden, I mean, these are simple stone structures. Papillion Hall, there's no photo, 1903. Again, no photo, 1911. So I'm assuming that, you know, Papillion took him quite a while. But, you know, in the space of two years, he's taken on another two, which are very simple, I guess. And now it gets interesting. There's a gap here. And then Hyderabad House. So now he's in India. Okay, and not building these tiny little stone red brick shanties. Now he's building <laughs> palaces. Domed columned, arched palaces. So 1928. Was that started or was that completed? Regardless, it took more than 10 years and 10 years ago he was building this in East S Sussex. So, okay, well, okay, so that's 28. 1929, another dome column structure. So that's within one year. So he's designing these all over India now and handing out the designs to masons who have never built these before uh, and now currently professional Roman Gothic like architects. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. So now he's back in Devon in the very next year building Castle Drogo. Uh, so that's all within three years, those three buildings and they're all palace castles. 35, the Midland Bank a huge stone structure. It looks really heavy, doesn't it? Almost looks like concrete. 36 Baroda House, the very next year. Oh, it's in India. So, Devon to India again. And Baroda House, New Delhi. And I understand that the architect is not the builder. But he has to be on site a lot of the time for his ideas to be manifested into reality. Anyway, I thought I'd leave it there for today. Until next time, my name's Phil, and this is Tartarian Zephyr. I hope you have a nice rest of your day or evening. And if you have any comments or requests, please leave them below in the comments section. And thank you to all my subs who have sent me emails and in Insta photos and information. It's all much appreciated, and I'll see you next time.